Well, good morning, Cover Chapel, Panama City Beach. Nice to be with you this morning. Uh, my name is Eric Tribble. For those of you who might be visiting, and I'm filling in for your pastor, Pastor Anthony Noble. And uh, just looking forward to our study this morning. We're in Revelation chapter 12. If you'd like to turn there and our study of the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 12. And, uh, you know, I was wondering uh, this time of year if you guys are starting to see people come in uh, to the city for uh, spring break. And so I know that uh, Panama City Beach is one of those destination spots. And so uh, we're keeping the church in prayer uh, about really uh, just an influx of people. And, uh, you know, the ministry is all about people, Jesus wanting to reach the lives of, of people. So... I pray that the Lord will uh, give you guys uh, divine appointments. You know, you really, you really can't minister to people that are just like have been drinking and all they're thinking about is partying and going crazy. But I just pray the Lord would give you guys divine appointments that the Lord would show you uh, that person, those opportunities where uh, the Lord knows that the people are ready to to hear a message from the Lord. And uh, I pray that the Lord would connect you guys with people that have come down for spring break that um, need to hear from Jesus and uh, that, that the Lord will speak to them through you. So uh, keep your, and you know, your spiritual antennas up and just pray, you know, as you just go throughout your normal uh, daily routine there, you know, just pray, Lord, if you have a divine appointment for me, just point it out, Lord, and give me the faith to step forward uh, that you might use, uh, uh, you know, asking God that he might use your life. So anyway, you guys are in a, a unique uh, city and uh, the Lord has um, certainly got plans for you guys. I'm sorry. Oh, Jonathan, you got that? Okay. So Revelation chapter 12, and let's pray. We'll ask the Lord to bless our, our time in the word. Heavenly Father, we do thank you uh, for this time, uh, for this church service, and for this opportunity to study your word, Lord, the book of Revelation. We pray that you'll give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to perceive all that you would speak and want to accomplish this very day in our lives. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, Revelation chapter 12 is, uh, is it really a unique section in the book of Revelation. Uh, we've been looking at this special dispensation, these uh, uh, seven years of Earth's final history in the book of Revelation. And uh, we've been watching things sort of move along uh, uh, in a chronological order. But here in the 12th chapter, we're, we're at a, a place where the chronology of events is paused and the Lord is, is revealing uh, some spiritual truth about uh, the situation. And so what we're going to be looking at today is uh, we're going to be looking at things that sort of take place behind the scenes in the spiritual realm. And we're going to see really the attack of Satan against the work of God. You know, the Bible speaks of Satan as an adversary. And he is an adversary to God. He is an adversary to the work of God. And he is the adversary of God's people. And so the devil is always working to try and cause trouble and to try and hinder or hold back uh, the, the spread of the gospel, people coming to know the love of Jesus Christ and for uh, finding the forgiveness of sins. And as we'll see in the study today, Satan was actually very much involved in uh, trying to keep Jesus from actually coming into this world, that Satan was working to try and destroy Jesus uh, even at his birth. And that's kind of how the, the, uh, the study is going to begin with that sort of a scenario. Um, we're also going to see that Satan is against Israel because um, not only was Jesus born uh, as the promised Messiah to Israel, but God has plans and purposes for the nation of Israel 
uh, that are related to God's coming kingdom. And so Satan uh, stands against the nation of Israel, trying to tear that nation down because much of God's plans and purposes are connected to the nation of Israel. So we're going to be looking behind the scenes, behind the physical, to the spiritual aspects and the spiritual warfare uh, that uh, many times is, is taking place uh, behind the scenes. So my message is entitled, The Woman, the Dragon, and the Child. The Woman, the Dragon, and the Child. So let's begin in chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. And being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his head. With his tail he drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who is ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. So here, uh, just in the first uh, four verses, we see the woman, we see the dragon, and we see the child. Now, the woman is the nation of Israel, and she is depicted here, the nation of Israel, uh, with a great sign. John says, a great sign appeared in heaven, and he describes Israel as a woman who is clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a garland of 12 stars upon her head. As we you know, wonder about the woman, we might think, well, could this be Mary? She gives birth to the male child who is to rule all nations, that's Jesus. Could this perhaps be a, a reference to Mary? Um, but the way the woman is described uh, and also what happens to the woman in the chapter, clearly the woman is not Mary. It's a, it's a reference, it's a sign to the nation of Israel. Concerning, concerning the sun, the moon, and the stars, helping us to identify the woman as Israel, this takes us back to the book of Genesis. You remember way back in the book of Genesis that uh, Jacob, who, whose name was changed to Israel, that Jacob had 12 sons. And one of his youngest sons was Joseph. And God had a special plan for Joseph. And um, so God began to give Joseph dreams. And Joseph had a particular dream, and he told it to his father. And he said, you know, Dad, in my dream, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars bowed down to me. And uh, Jacob uh, answered and said to Joseph, what is this dream that you have dreamed? He said, shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come and bow down to you? Jacob understood that in Joseph's dream, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars referred to Jacob, Jacob's wife, and also uh, Joseph's brothers. And um, so here we see the nation of Israel uh, depicted in this way, and we have the Old Testament to help us sort of uh, uh, decipher uh, the meaning of a woman clothed with the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars, uh, a garland of 12 stars on her head. This is uh, the nation of Israel. Number two, or verse two, <laughs> being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. So this takes us back in time now to the birth of Christ, the days in which the nation of Israel was about to bring forth uh, their Messiah. Now, another sign, verse 3, appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon. So uh, this sign hardly needs any interpretation. But in case you're wondering, if you look over at verse 9, uh, this dragon is called there uh, the devil and Satan. So this great fiery red dragon is a, a representation of, of Satan. 
So the sign appeared in, in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, or Israel, who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. So you will remember that um, when, when Jesus was born, that wise men from the east came and uh, they followed a star that they had seen. And these wise men came into Israel and the star then sort of uh, disappeared. It, it became difficult to see. Maybe clouds were, you know, uh, weather was in the area. And so the wise men made the wisest decision that they could. And they went to Jerusalem because Jerusalem was the religious capital of Israel. And so they said, hey, where, where is the king of the Jews who has been born? Because we've seen his star in the east and we've come to worship him. And the ruler uh, of Israel at that time, the Roman ruler was a man named Herod. And Herod was a very jealous, insecure, and wicked man. And when he heard that the king of the Jews had been born, Herod quickly devised a plan to try to discover where the king of the Jews had, uh, where he was, and Herod's intentions was to then kill him. This is depicted here uh, uh, as uh, we look behind Herod, and we see that it was more than just the motive of a man. Uh, a jealous man who wanted to protect his authority and his kingdom. It was more than just a man who was trying to destroy the king of the Jews, but the devil himself was the ultimate influencer behind the situation. And so we read then uh, in the Gospel of Matthew how Herod told the wise men, uh, well, the Christ is to be born in Bethlehem, and Herod said to the wise men, you go find him and then bring back word to me. And Herod lied and said, I want to come and worship him also. And so the wise men headed off towards uh, Bethlehem. The star reappeared and then they found Jesus uh, and his parents. And Jesus was there as a, uh, 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 and um, they, they presented their, their gifts to him. But interestingly enough, God warned the wise men, don't return to Herod. Uh, and then God warned Mary and Joseph, take the young child and flee to Egypt because Herod is going to seek to destroy the child. Herod, when he found out that he had been deceived by the wise men, he went and destroyed all the children two years and under in all the districts of Bethlehem, seeking to try and eliminate uh, simply by just a broad brush putting to death all the children two years old and under. You say, what a horrible thing that this man did, putting to death children. Yes, but you see from such a place as this in Revelation that there was a great spiritual power behind this man's thoughts and his actions. It was no one less than the devil himself because the devil was seeking to devour the Christ child as soon as he was born. Why? Because Jesus is the savior of the world. People are today forgiven of their sins and destined for heaven because of what God accomplished in sending his son, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross and he died there for our sins. And God has now made the promise that whosoever will believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. The devil hates that. The devil doesn't want to see anyone saved. The devil wants to grab a hold of as many people as he can and drag them to hell with uh, himself. But God has a different plan. God sent his son Jesus because he loves the world. Jesus died on the cross. He was buried the third day he rose from the grave. And now God is trying to gather as many people unto Jesus that we can go to heaven and be with Jesus where he is. So God and the devil are, have two 
uh, diametrically opposed agendas. God's plan for you is forgiveness, love, and heaven. The devil's plan for you is condemnation and hell with him. And so there's a great battle. It's a battle that you cannot see, that you and I cannot physically see with our eyes, but the scripture makes us aware that this thing is going on. Um, so we, we, we're reading this here. Uh, by the way, just as a little bit of a technical note, you'll read in verse 4 that Satan uh, with his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to heaven. We believe that that is Satan's temptation of the angels, that when Satan himself fell, that Satan took a third of the angels with him. It's from this text here in verse 4. But where we are in the scenario is back at the birth of Jesus, and the dragon is standing before the woman to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child, verse 5, who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron, that's Jesus Christ, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So we go from the birth of Christ through his life, his death, burial, and we're brought to the time of Jesus' resurrection, speaking of Jesus' victory in accomplishing uh, uh, the salvation of mankind. So um, she bore the child to rule the nations. Her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she is a place prepared by God that they should feed her there for 1,260 days. Now you say, now what is that? And when did that happen? Well, uh, verse six has not happened yet. Now, the, the, as the story unfolds uh, from the beginning of, of verse one in chapter 12, the, the scenario runs through verse five, and then the, the prophetic clock stops at the ascension of Christ and it remains stopped until we get three and a half years into the tribulation period, where then we're told the woman fled into the wilderness where she is a place prepared by God for uh, that they should feed her there for 1,260 days. Now, I'm, I'm giving you the, the, the teaching of verse 6 by, by way of interpretation, and we're going to try and build some scriptures around it. But, but here's the scenario. Once... Jesus Christ rose from the dead and the, the church was born, um, God at that point basically set Israel aside. And though the gospel began among the Jewish people in Israel, it quickly spread to the Gentiles and then spread around the world through uh, Gentiles, non-Jews, receiving the message of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins. But Israel, as you know today, Israel does not receive Jesus as their Messiah. And so God has set Israel aside. So during this time period where Israel has been set aside, God's prophetic time clock concerning Israel is stopped. Verse 6, where the woman flees into the wilderness we see that God's time clock has started again. Now, God's time clock starts with the nation of Israel at the beginning of the tribulation period. But here we're taken three and a half years into the tribulation to the time of, I believe, the abomination of desolation uh, spoken of um, by Jesus in Matthew chapter 24. The abomination of Desolation and gee, I'm sorry if you guys are visiting and you haven't been with us in the book of Revelation Some of this stuff may be a little bit difficult to get your mind around But we've been studying this for a number of weeks. So, you know with prophecy We're putting pieces of the puzzle together as you're joining us today You might be looking at the puzzle and saying I don't really see it, but we're gonna do our best for you as we can um, Three and a half years into the tribulation period the Antichrist is going to enter the rebuilt temple in Israel. And the Antichrist, who's the, world, the world's final leader, is going to declare that he himself is God and he is going to demand to be worshipped. 
So this world's final ruler, the Antichrist, will literally go into the rebuilt temple of the Jews and declare in the temple that he himself is God. The scripture calls that, or refers to that as the abomination of desolation. He defiles the temple. That's why it's an abomination that causes desolation because of the Antichrist's blasphemy, claiming that he himself is God. It, it uh, defiles the temple. Well, Jesus warned the Jews that when they would see the abomination of desolation, that they were to flee Israel. And that's what we're seeing in Revelation 12, the woman uh, fleeing into the wilderness. Jesus warned the Jews, when you see the abomination of desolation, this is still future in, in time. When you see that, Jesus said, flee until the wilderness, because then the Antichrist, when he recognizes that the Jews do not receive him uh, uh, as God, when, when the Antichrist recognizes that, the, Jew, the, the Antichrist is going to then persecute the Jews bitterly. So listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, uh, beginning in verse 15. Jesus said, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let him who is on the housetop not go down and take anything out of his house and let him who is in the field not go back and get his clothes but woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days and pray that your flight may not be in the winter on the Sabbath for then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, the days will be shortened. So here, uh, you know, um, Jesus has spoken that when the abomination takes place, he has, he, has, uh, he has forewarned the Jews, when you see that, you need to run into the wilderness. Jesus said, I mean, if you're out in the field, don't even come back into the house to grab something. If you're on the housetop, when you just jump off the roof and when you hit the ground, you just start running because the Antichrist is going to persecute the Jews as he realizes that they do not receive him. And so here, beginning in, uh, in verse 6, I believe that we are at the moment of the abomination of desolation here in verse 6, where it says that the woman fled into the wilderness where she is a place prepared by God. We believe that that is the rock city of Petra there uh, in Jordan, which is about, um, oh, it's about 50 miles south of the Dead Sea. There uh, in Jordan is this rock city of Petra built into the, the hillside. Uh, and, and we believe that, that this is what the place where the Jews will, will actually flee to. So the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there for 1,260 days. That's three and a half years, the final end of the tribulation period. Now, moving on, uh, verse seven, it says, and war broke out in heaven. Now, I personally think that the war that breaks out in heaven here is over the issue of the abomination of desolation, that Satan has influenced such an offense that Satan would send his man, the Antichrist, into the rebuilt temple of the Jews, uh, the temple which will be called by God's name, and that this man will uh, speak openly, claiming that he himself is God, and he will demand the world to worship him uh, I believe that, that on account of this event, we read what takes place then in verse 7. And war broke out in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. So I, I believe that 
that this war in heaven takes place over the ungodly act influenced by Satan, the abomination of desolation. So there's this battle that takes place. Michael, he's a good angel. We read about him in Daniel and other places. Michael is called uh, the archangel. So Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought. But in verse eight, they did not prevail. That is the dragon. They did not prevail, nor was the place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. <laughs> Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. So um, the scenario, you know, goes something like this. Um, you know, at, at the abomination of desolation, I, I believe it's over that issue. The Bible does not directly say that. But... Um, when that event takes place, war breaks out in heaven because Satan has risen up such an offense that Satan's presence can no longer be tolerated in heaven. Did you know that today Satan does have access into the heavenly realm? And as we read, he is the accuser of the brethren. The Bible teaches that Satan still has access into the heavenly scene. And that he uses his, ac uh, his access to accuse people before God. You remember that um, uh, on one occasion, the angels of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came with them. And God said to Satan, where have you come from? And, and Satan said, walking back to and, forth, to and fro on the earth and, and uh, you know, considering those on it. And God said, well, have you considered my servant Job? Oh man, I hope God doesn't bring up my name. He, he probably has no reason to, but the, uh, God says, have you considered my servant Job that there's none like him on the earth? He's an upright man. He's just and he's faithful. And Satan said, well, let me at him and I'll bet, I'll bet Job will, will, will blaspheme you and he'll curse you to your face. And so the, the beginnings of the book of Job, that's how it starts. But you see there that Satan does have access to heaven and that when Satan conversed with God in heaven, Satan accused Job that Job only served God for what Job could get out of it. And that if, if God took away Job's blessings, Job would curse God to his face. That was the accusation of Satan. And so the book of Job, you know, unfolds where God does take away Job's blessings to prove that Job was a man who truly loved God. And Satan was proved wrong. Job was faithful. But that's a, 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 a little background to, to, to um, illustrate that Satan today still has access to heaven. And in his access to heaven, um, he is the accuser of the brethren. He accuses us uh, before God. Um, and so at this point... Three and a half years into the tribulation period, uh, that much is sure uh, that it is at the three and a half year mark, and that's why part of the reason why I believe it's over the abomination of desolation. Verse nine says the dragon was cast out; Satan is cast out of heaven. At this point, three and a half years into the tribulation, no longer having access there, and so that great dragon was cast out that serpent of old called the devil uh, and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So this is a judgment that is passed on the devil. Uh, the devil's end is approaching. He has now been cast out of heaven uh, and just from that point, it'll only be a few short years 
before he's confined into the bottomless pit. We read about that in chapter 19. And then he will be taken out of the bottomless pit and cast into the lake of fire, which will be Satan's final judgment. So judgment is beginning to fall on Satan and his grip on things is, is weakening. And um, so then we read of his rage uh, against uh, mankind because of his, his, his sense of judgment in his limited time. We read about that at the, at the middle of verse 10 where it says, um, um, oh, I, I guess it's actually verse 12, where uh, the angel is saying, Rejoice, O heavens, and, and those who dwell in them, uh, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth, verse 12, and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. And so Satan uh, being cast out of heaven. Now, verse 13, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, so we're three and a half years in the tribulation period, the abomination of desolation has taken place. The Jews have, will not worship the Antichrist. They, they are fleeing from the Antichrist. Satan is losing his, his grip. He's cast out of heaven to the earth. When the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. So here, Satan, through, the, uh, through his vessel, the Antichrist, begins to persecute the Jews. Uh, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Verse 14, But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly to the wilderness. This is what we saw in verse 6. It's a repetition of what we saw in verse 6. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time, times, and a half a time from the presence of the serpent, three and a half years. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, uh, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged, enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So there is just so much battling going on. In this chapter, I mean, it's one great big battle, um, but you know, it 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 pulls the veil back on the intensity of what's going on in the spiritual realm, and so I want to talk about some things kind of as we wrap this up. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit more about these verses, and then uh, verses fourteen through seventeen. And then I want to talk about some things um, concerning uh, how we get the victory over the work of the devil. So in verse 14, Israel is fleeing into the wilderness where she has a place where she will be nourished for three and a half years from the presence of the serpent. It is commonly thought that the rock city of Petra will be that place where, um, where uh, the Israelites will find uh, refuge. Uh, one of the scriptural uh, cross-references to that is in Isaiah 26, verse 20, where God says, Come, my people, and enter your chambers. Shut your doors behind you and hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past, for behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for its iniquity. So it's speaking of the tribulation period there and the Jews uh, uh, hiding themselves uh, until the time of the tribulation is past. And um, so the rock city of Petra, um, verse 15 says that as the Jews are fleeing. So the abomination of desolation, the Jews are like, 
The Antichrist is not the person who he thought he was. They begin to flee out of the land. And the Antichrist begins to pursue them. Here it's spoken of as the serpent spewing water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. This could be some sort of a, of a, a, a you know, some uh, act of weather where there's a heavy rain and flood that Satan is able to um, maybe create. My personal opinion is that this is the uh, troops of the Antichrist that pursue the fleeing Israelites. And as the, tr the troops of the Antichrist seem uh, get uh, come upon the Israelites as they're fleeing, God simply opens the earth and swallows up the army that is, is chasing after them. That's my uh, personal, you know, if I, if I have to direct the chosen on this, you know what I mean? I'll have the Antichrist and his troops going after the people. Um, they might choose to have a huge rainstorm that was somehow brought on by the devil. But either way, the flood after the woman is swallowed up by the earth as God opens the chasm uh, to, to, um, to catch uh, that which was seeking to overtake his people. The earth helped the woman. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And then what happens? The dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So um, the devil having lost his grip on those Israelites then seeks to persecute the born-again Christians, because our gospel has come to us through the Jewish Messiah, and he seeks to then um, persecute terribly uh, the believers. And so we read then in the uh, book of Revelation, we'll look at it in the 13th chapter, that uh, the Antichrist puts everyone to death that will not bow down and worship him or receive his mark. And so I uh, um, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how many people he's able to get his hands on, but he overcomes uh, quite a few. And so uh, we see this, the, the, the activity of the devil behind human affairs. The warfare begins in the heavenly realm, and then it is played out in the earthly scene. You say, well, Eric, what protection do I have? Well, <laughs> one thing, as a child of God, God is protecting you. He, he protects the Israelites who are fleeing into the wilderness, right? And, and they're not even necessarily born-again Christians at that time. But they're God's people in that they're descendants of Abraham. So, number one, you're under the protection and the care of God as a born-again Christian. God loves you. You're under his personal care and protection. God has a plan. He has a purpose for your life. Uh, God has given you certain tools to protect yourself from the devil. Uh, one of the tools that God has protected you, uh, given you to protect yourself from the devil, is God has said, sin not. Okay? Part of how the devil seeks to destroy our lives is he tempts us to sin. Spring break in Panama City Beach, people are sinning against God and many lives are getting messed up and destroyed. People, you know, OD uh, on spring break. People get in drunk driving accidents. Uh, people, you know, from, from drinking too much don't realize the trouble that they're getting into till the next morning. And then they realize they made bad decisions. Uh, so one of the protections that God has given you is he's told you, hey, sin not, sin not. And so that is one of God's protections. But here particularly, um, we're told how people overcome the devil. Look at verse 11, verse 11. It says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. So this is talking about the tribulation period. 
How did people escape the clutches of the devil during the tribulation period? Number one, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. By trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ, the Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses a man from all sin. And by putting their faith in Jesus Christ, the blood of the lamb saved their soul. They overcame the devil. They escaped his clutches. They did not end up in, in hell where the devil is headed because they trusted that Jesus Christ died on the cross, that his blood was shed, and, and because they believed in that, God forgave them of their sins and numbered them as one of his children. So verse 11, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Secondly, they overcame him by the word of their testimony, what they said. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For uh, with the mouth, one uh, confesses uh, unto righteousness and, one, and believes in the heart unto salvation. You know, it's important that if you're a believer, that you stand up and say so. Jesus said, if you will confess me before men, I will confess you in heaven before my father and before his angels. And so it's important as a believer, you're trusting in Jesus Christ and his death on the cross for your sins. But it's also important that you speak up and that you say something about it. These guys overcame the devil by the word of their testimony, not only for themselves, but they overcame the work of the devil in other people's lives because of the word of their testimony. You see, this takes us back to where we started this morning. There are people in Panama City Beach over spring break that need to hear your testimony. And as you give them your testimony, the work of the devil will be, will be stripped out of their lives. As people hear your testimony about the love of God, the goodness of God, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, when people hear your testimony, the work of the devil will be stripped out of their lives as they, like you, turn to faith in Jesus Christ and ask you to pray with them so that they can get their lives right with God. So the devil is overcome by the blood of Jesus Christ because he died on the cross for our sins. He's overcome by the word of our testimony. We, we confess with our mouth and also the people who hear us, their lives are helped and finally, it says uh, in verse 11, and they did not love their lives to the death. You guys, if you love your life, you may not come to Jesus. You know, there are people that you could be sharing with uh, on the beach there in spring break, and they don't want to hear it because they're loving their life at, at this moment. They're out of school. They're on the sand. The sun is shining, you know. <laughs> There's people around, there's parties to go to, there's things to do. They're loving their life. They don't want to hear about the gospel, but their soul, their soul is not saved and their destiny is not upward. It's downward. And so the person who says, you know what? I would be willing to turn from my sins in order that I might be forgiven. The person who is willing to say, you know, this is my life and, 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 but I'm willing to set my life aside to trust in Jesus Christ that I might have eternal life and be forgiven. That person, uh, because they did not love their life to the death, uh, that is what gave them the, the ability to overcome. Some people love their lives so much that they will hold on to their lives all the way to the grave and their soul would be lost. You know, they say in Africa that um, in order to catch monkeys, what they'll do is they'll take a coconut and they'll hollow out their, that coconut, leaving a hole just big enough for a monkey to put his hand inside the hole of that coconut. So what they'll do is they'll take rice and they'll put it inside the coconut 
and they'll tether the coconut to something like a tree. Lay the coconut on the ground. The monkey comes around, picks up the coconut. He looks inside, he smells it. And he realizes there's food in there. He puts his hand in the hole of the coconut, feels the rice and he makes a fist and he can't pull his hand back out of the coconut. And of course, the coconut is tethered to the tree. And so the, the monkey is trapped because he won't let go of the rice. <laughs> he loves his life so much, he won't let go of the rice and the coconut. And so then uh, the, the captors, they come and they just pick the guy up. You know, he's, he can't go anywhere. If he had just let go of the rice, he could have went free, but he won't let go of the rice. Some people love their lives so much that they rather live the way they want to and lose their own soul rather than turning from their sins and turning to faith in Jesus Christ. I hope you can see from the illustration of a monkey that it's not wise to keep such a firm grip on the things that you know are sinful and wrong, just that you might enjoy them for a little while and then in the end, lose your own soul. Jesus asked the question, what does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? You know, girls, you want love, you want acceptance, and you may be holding on to that so tightly that you're getting involved with things with guys that you know that you shouldn't, but God has a better plan for you. If you can let go of trying to find fulfillment through relationships, you can find fulfillment through a relationship with God's son, Jesus Christ, and have eternal life with him. And so, you know, guys, you're, you're out there and you're wanting to be somebody and you're wanting to be in the mix of all that is now and that is happening and that is fun. But you know what? Your life's getting messed up through that and you know it. You have to let go of those things that are sinful and displease the Lord. And you need to come back to Jesus Christ and you need to recommit your life to following him. You know that God has a good plan for you. You know that he loves you. You know that he has the gift of eternal life to those who would believe and follow him. So I would encourage, don't let, this, you know, don't let the devil take you down like he is so many other people. But reach out to God. Reach out to God and find forgiveness and find eternal life. You know, God is willing to forgive any sin that you've ever committed. He, he is wanting for you to bow the knee to him and to trust him if you will but be willing uh, to accept him and to do that. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the study of your word today. Lord, as you have taken us behind the scenes into the spiritual realm, and we realize, Lord, that there is a battle and it's all over eternal life and what Jesus Christ has accomplished on the cross. God, I pray that you will help anyone who is there listening to the message this morning and they know that their lives are not right with you. Lord, help them to just turn their lives over to you today and to make things right. Lord, that their lives might not be destroyed in Panama City Beach this spring, but that their souls might be saved in Panama City Beach this spring. So Lord, bless your people, bless your church. We ask your blessing upon Pastor Anthony and Desiree that you will strengthen them and bring them back into the uh, teaching function, Lord, in the church, Lord. And uh, may your grace, Lord, may your grace rest upon the people of Calvary Chapel, Panama City Beach. Lord, I pray that your grace will rest upon the area of Panama City Beach as it's heading into spring break days. Lord, and I pray that your spirit will work. I pray that your spirit will save. I pray that your spirit will work. I pray that you will give your people, Lord, those divine appointments. Help them to be watchful. Help them to be ready when, when that occasion dawns upon them, they might realize, hey, this is the work that God has called me to do at this moment. May, may your people see it. May they engage themselves upon it 
and may you uh, may you bless them in the midst of it. And so, Lord, we thank you for these things this morning, and we worship you, and we commit ourselves to you, God, in the name of Jesus. And all God's family said, amen, amen. All right. Well, the Lord bless you guys. And um, hey, just one final thought, one final thought for you. You know, um, it says here of the devil that he is the accuser of the brethren. Hey, let's not be like that. Let's not be like the devil and, and, and be uh, uh, accusing uh, one another. Let's, let's not be like that. Um, it speaks of uh, the, the word devil. It means slanderer, slanderer. Let's not be like that. Let's not be slandering and accusing. Instead, let's use the words of our mouth to glorify God and to preach the gospel. Amen. Uh, David said in Psalm 34, he who would love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil. And so I don't know, it's something out of the text here and, and maybe, uh, maybe there's some application there, but, uh, may you use, uh, as David, uh, uh, who said this? I think it was David. He said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God. And may the Lord have his hand upon you uh, for these things and be in your midst in a very special way. And uh, we look forward to uh, tuning in and uh, being with you guys next week. Until then, God bless you.